George Osborne and Ed Ball's new podcast is always a pretty cosy affair. We mostly get to hear the architect of austerity and the then Labour shadow chancellor who barely opposed that deadly programme, chummily launder each other's reputations. But every now and again, one of them says something interesting, revealing the hidden mechanisms of British political power. Here's a little anecdote from George Osborne on a recent episode. And the only time she ever directly interfered in politics, I think I can also tell this story, was I was at a state dinner and she came up to me and she said, the chief of the defence staff is unable to answer my question. He told me to go and speak to the defence secretary. I went to see the defence secretary and he told me to come and speak to you. So I'm asking you, you're not going to close, are you, the Highland Bagpipe School of the British Army? I was like, of course not, Your Majesty. So the next day I get into the Treasury. I said, is there a, like, is there a sort of bagpipe school? And for God's sake, tell me we're not closing it down. And uh, the Treasury didn't know, or my private office didn't know immediately, and they scurried on. And they said, yes, apparently there's a kind of Highland Music School as part of the army bands, and we are making some cuts to those. And I said, well, we're not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately sent a message back to the palace that... Uh, she could be reassured that the uh, the pipers of the British Army would remain well trained. Remember, during austerity, essential services across the country were shut down. Right? If that screwed teenagers or single parent families or the disabled, that didn't matter. But if it annoyed the Queen, well, that's a different story. That's all it took. All it took was the Queen to say, "Oh, I don't want you to shut that service," and it survived. Now, to pick up on just one area where the Queen's interventions might have been more helpful, let's look at youth services across England and Wales. Youth services saw their budgets slashed by almost a billion pounds between 2011 and 2019. According to research by the YMCA in 2011, the budget allocation for youth services was £1.4 billion eight years later, and it had fallen to just over £400 million. So that's a real terms drop of 70%. Now, as you can imagine, those cuts led to the loss of 4,500 youth work jobs and the closure of 760 youth clubs. And they also had a major impact on youth crime. In a recent report on youth services, funding and crime amongst young people, the National Youth Agency cited these findings. Between 2010 and 2019, almost a quarter of youth centres in London closed against a backdrop of 71% um, cut in youth service expenditure in the city and residents' crime participation for young people aged 10 to 15 increased by 10%. Incidents of crime rose by 8% for those aged 10 to 15. This is driven by drug crimes. A small incident, 2% of violence crimes happening near youth centres also increase after closures um, and youth centre closures impacted youth centre attendance after closures in London. Young people were 14% less likely to attend any youth centre in the city. Um, aside from being socially damaging and ruining young people's lives, Osborne's cuts to youth services weren't even good economics. According to a 2009 Audit Commission report, each young person in the criminal justice system cost the taxpayer over £200,000 by the time they're 16, but supporting a kid to stay out of trouble costs less than £50,000. Um, Helena, I suppose... I'm not sure what's grosser there, sort of George Osborne sort of chuckling along, saying, oh yes, we cut all of these essential services, but then the Queen didn't want us to cut the bagpipe school, so we didn't cut the bagpipe school. Or, or Ed Balls laughing along. You know, Ed Balls, who was supposed to, you know, he was the opposition. He was supposed to be, he should have said at that point, you know, that's disgusting, George. You know, there were many times in Parliament when I was saying you shouldn't shut this youth centre or you shouldn't shut that Sure Start centre and um, because of the social consequences it would have, have. You didn't listen to me, but you listened to the Queen because she likes bagpipe music, right? But that, that just seems so alien to them. It's just, I, I find how out of touch they are, I mean, offensive, frankly. Oh, yeah. I mean, Ed Balls has always been a pathetic individual. Like, they, he, when he was Shadow Chancellor, he fully accepted the narrative of austerity. But I guess that narrative just kind of has broken down now and that we all realised that it was never about balancing the books. It was always an ideological project where the upper classes of this country saw fit to try and completely remove all state provision for anybody who they didn't feel was deserving, i.e. anybody not from their social class. Uh, and so they were very happy to be able to change uh, and to undermine the actual stated goal of austerity, these efficiency savings, which is, of course, you know, if you're going to make efficiency savings, maybe the bagpipe school might be somewhere that you'd start. Not that I wanted to get cut. Anyway, I didn't want any cuts. But this move towards the, the big society they were talking about, it was always a massive lie. And we know that it's a lie. And it was obviously bad economics in terms of 
um, the false economy that it created, right? We now have a very unproductive society because we've been so immiserated by falling living standards, all because of the failures of austerity and supply side labor market policy. And the result is terrifying, right? It's Ed Balls Charlie laughing along with George Osborne. When we have the stats, we know that 330,000 people up to uh, excess deaths because of austerity. To put that in context, 300,000 people died in Idi Amin's purges. So well done, George. You're definitely high on the leaderboard in terms of that regard. And there's this lack of empathy towards these kind of people is endemic to the ideological project of auster- the ideological project of austerity. And just to put that into further perspective on how it was completely ideological and didn't actually fulfill its remit, in that the debt to GDP ratio continued to increase every year that he was chancellor. They never got the deficit under control like they told us that they would. They just completely hamstrung our economy forever. But they were very happy to continue quantitative easing and pump huge amounts of state money into the pockets of the financial sector so that we could get growth at least somewhere, even if it wasn't growth in terms of money in the pockets of working people in this country. And so whether it's the Queen or whether it's the financial sector in London that George Osborne is great friends with, there was always going to be exceptions to the rule when it came to austerity. Absolutely. Um, A message from us. Everything on this show and Navarra Media as a whole is funded by the regular supporters who donate to us on our website each and every month. But a question to you. Can you guess what the average donation is. Are we like other media outlets that receive massive funding from the rich? Well, I'll tell you the reality. So far this year, the average monthly donation we've received is just £6.31. So we really mean it when we say we are people powered because we're powered by our audience, by ordinary working people like all of you watching now. So thank you if you're a regular supporter. And if you're not yet, then please do consider heading to our website. That's navaramedia.com slash support. Whether it's one pound or two pounds or one hour's wage per month, it keeps this show going. That link is in the description below. We've got another clip for you. So uh, that clip we just showed you was just one example of how Osborne and Ball sit down and freely admit some of the distasteful realities of British politics. There was another a few weeks back that's worth talking about though. And it was also about someone powerful but someone far more powerful than the Queen. By the time I got to the top of British politics, uh, we had to go and see Rupert Murdoch rather than the other way around. Of course, news that uh, Rupert Murdoch has just stepped down as chairman of what news kind of in action. inverted commas stepped down. He's I mean, chairman has, emeritus. Has, has he really stepped down? This really? is uh, Brian Cox style really? stepping down. Um, but, you know, it was a very important to try and get the Murdoch newspapers, which had backed Labour for many, many years to support us. And David Cameron and I would go and speak to him and speak to members of his family. Mm. On one occasion, we were in his uh, swimming pool. Um, If this is not confirming too many cliches about the uh, closeness of politics. You were in Rupert Murdoch's swimming pool? In Rupert Murdoch's swimming pool. And um, one one of the young Cameron children, very young Cameron children, did a little poo in the pool. And thankfully, Rupert hadn't seen it. And um, Dave and I looked at each other and said, "This is this is our election chance. It's going down the drain." And so, or not going down the drain. Or not it was going, floating. It was it? floating. So we just had to pick it up and throw it away. Oh, well. And there we go. And, and I have never pretty, been in Rupert Murdoch's swimming pool. What can I say? What can I say? Well, that's that's why you lost. And for the record, whose hand scooped it out? Well, the Cameron Osborne partnership was incredibly tight, and we keep those things secret. Oh, come on. Was it, Cameron, was it Cameron's Cameron, dainty hand? Cameron knew how to shovel his own shit. Oh, God, I've got a little bit of sick in my mouth, and it's not because of the talk of poo, right? It's because of looking at those smug faces as they discussed how, you know, they all know it. Ed Balls knows it, how much you have to cozy up to the Murdochs. Just imagine oh, George Osborne, David Cameron in, in, in Rupert Murdoch's pool with all of their family trying to encourage him to give them active support at the next general election. That's not democracy. That's not democracy. Um, Helena, what did you make of, 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 of that particular clip, which I found especially nauseating? I mean, it just shows that, you know, we were talking earlier about undermining British democracy and they just show you what democracy, like what democracy do we have when a singular poo in a Murdoch pool could potentially undermine the potent, which, which is going to be the next government? Because that's not a democracy. That's not a democracy that we live in. Right? Another hilarious story was one we had a few months back of Sebastian Payne being a bo- boarding at Jacob Rees-Mogg's house, just appearing downstairs in his dressing gown, showing that it's really not a political class and a media class that holds them to 
into account. It's a political class and a media class who sleep in the same bed. And we've all seen already what happens when you try and challenge what the media do. They destroy you, like they destroyed Jeremy Corbyn from 2015 to 2019 because he refused to play their game. And at this point, I get loads of people, right? I do a lot of commentary on things like whether or not you should be voting for the Labour Party. And they say um, the Labour Party's failure to have a proper alternative to Conservatives. And the response I always hear is, oh, well, you can't do anything too radical, otherwise the media will attack you. And I'm like, okay, you're just going to let the media choose the policy? Why have elections anymore? Just let Rupert Murdoch anoint a new a new prime minister, a new all-powerful politician, and just get rid of the sham already. Because <laughs> at this point, if a singular pool and a Murdoch pool can change the entire election, then our democracy is all is only in name at this point. 